Welcome to Leicester Possibility, episode 67 on the 18th of March 2013. Tonight we're talking about how and why to become an active citizen. We're talking with Walter Pike, Colin Byrne and Mabine Siabi. Thanks for listening. Welcome to Let's Talk Possibility, where we explore ideas, challenge thinking, and inspire action. I'm Talana Simpson, and with me is co-host Mongezi Mtati. Hello, world. We're, we're talking active citizenry with three very active citizens. Colin Byrne is a concerned writer and very involved in his local community. Mabine Siabi is the co-founder and director of Youth Lab and is also a freelance columnist. And Walter Pike, joining us on Skype, is a leading thinker in the social era of marketing and is the founder of the, of the Digital Academy. So to start off with, I'd like to ask each of you to share how you are an active citizen. Briefly, what are the projects or areas that you're involved in? So perhaps let, let's start with you, Walter. Okay, cool. I'm, I, wonder, I suppose one of the big things is, is my involvement with Slack Talk, which is a uh, protest movement against um, against victim blaming and and things in this whole horrible space of of rape, but also other kind of assaults on on women and and I guess on children. But I'm also involved in a couple of other uh, in other spaces, and I'm um, busy developing a product uh, called Directed Activism, which is involved in trying to help make people. Um, on the ground, hold the the sort of authorities accountable for what they what they're doing, and 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 trying to coordinate that kind of effort together. Great, and Colin, how would uh, you say you're an active citizen? I'm a, a member of our ward committee. Um, I'm also chairman of the Dem Dem Democratic Alliance Party in my ward. I'm involved with the Committee for the Restoration of the uh, Ferndale Sprat. I do activism work in um, a township near, nearby called Sun Sprat. Uh, we assist uh, people who are victims of fires there to recover. Um, yeah, that's what I'm doing. <laughs> Very active. <laughs> a lot more than me. <laughs> And Mabine? Well, uh, I started up in 2011 a uh, platform for young people to discuss politics and, and any issue that really affects them called uh, Youth Lab. And basically the idea behind that was that, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty active on Twitter with other young people. I think a lot of young people use Twitter to, mm. to express themselves. And I thought, how can we bring this to life and and actually do something about it? So... With, with discussions that we have and research that we do, we form policy. And also, um, I'm part of an organization called My Vote Counts, which is pushing to change the electoral system so that we directly vote for our, our MPs through a constituency system. And also with that is that we want to change the way political parties are funded so it's transparent and also limits as to how much people can donate. Come on, we have some very active people yeah, here. Very, so, I mean, the, for me, the, the common theme, right, around what all of you guys are doing is that there seems to be some link or some, something to do with government or something to do with holding the government accountable and the citizens talking. Is, it, is, it, is that what active citizenship essentially is? But you know, I, I, if I can butt in at this stage, I don't think it's necessarily holding the government accountable. It's holding society accountable, which then possibly translates into into what happens at governmental level. Because it's it's not it's 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 kind of like not just us versus the government or against authority. It's it's us creating the environment in which we want to live. Mm. I think yeah. that's really what it's all about. Mm -hmm. Yes. You know, rather than waiting to see, have the environment develop around you without your input. In other words, you become then a victim of the environment. You have to be active in creating the environment that you want to see. And you were and saying that, that even that that's a concept in quantum physics. 
That's yeah, the, uh, a guy by the name of Bruce Lipton uh, did some experiments, and he was um, cultivating stem cells. And he, he his petri dish was becoming full, so he removed some of the stem cells into another petri dish. And to his amazement, these stem cells in the original dish, dish were uh, genetically identical, but when they were moved to a different environment, they actually changed. So you had cells that were that were cultivated, say, for uh, tissue, changing their form to be cells uh, that were muscle cells or bone cells or brain cells. And through that, he, he, he's come up with this very interesting idea that your environment actually affects your genetics just as much as you affect the mm -hmm. environment. So it's a du dualistic uh, kind of attitude. And I think that's very much the case. If you're not active in creating the environment you actually want to live in, then it has an effect on your consciousness, on how you feel and mm -hmm. how you are and how you believe and how you think. And I think, I think just in terms of, of the whole active citizenry thing, I think in, in 1995 we all kind of sat back and said we have a democratic, democratic government now and we can sit back and not do anything. Government will do everything for us. And with that, there was that result in where a lot of stuff fell apart. And now I think citizens are actually realizing that we can't depend on government, though it is a democratically elected government, we can't depend on it. As citizens, we're also part of society and we've got to give our input into that society. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, think that we, I think that we were exhausted hey, when, when, you know, in 1994. And it was almost like it was, a, it was just relief, you know, it's happened. We've got to the place that we wanted to get to, and now we can just leave it to happen. And, and I'm very encouraged, actually, to be honest, at, at how things are, are happening recently. I mean, there's a lot of bad stuff happening, but there's a lot of good stuff as well from, from that, that citizens are, in fact, becoming more active, and people are, are, are taking videos of what's happening out there. They... they, they holding people to account. The, we're getting less, I mean, sorry, let me rephrase that. I'm finding more and more, and maybe it's only a step-by-step -step process where people are grouping around issues. You know, we've had this whole thing in South Africa that we group around race, way, the race way of, of seeing things, and we, and we see ourselves, define ourselves in that way. But now with Sanrail and, and a whole lot of other things, I mean, I just see that, that South Africans are grouping around issues, and we want to try and fix those at South Africans. Yeah, uh, I think you know, that that is a wonderful change that I'm seeing as well, that people are examining or re-examining issues without the government stumbling block. They become societal issues rather than a government issue or a political issue. It, it's issues that, that we face every day. Correct. And just going back to, to government, I think we look at the National Development Plan that, mm. that basically env envisions the society we want to have in 2030. And one of the pillars, I mean, I've heard a number of commissioners talk about it, and every time the topic of active citizenry comes up, and they say that as citizens, we have to actually take ownership of that plan, and that the, the kind of society that we want, where we have 6% unemployment as opposed to 24 we have now, will only happen not only with government policies and places, but where as citizens we say, okay, this is the life we want, and we're going to work towards that. So how do we then, as, as you know, I'm just a one person, how do I then become an active citizen? How do I get, do something to, to make a difference? Well, that's, I, think, I think you've got to identify something that's, that you're passionate about. And it doesn't have to be on a large scale. It can be on a small scale. I mean, whether it's, it's education. I mean, education is a huge thing in South Africa. Mm. It affects everyone. It will affect our future. I think maybe then you say, hey, I'm just with my neighbors. We collect a box of books and donate it to a local school that may not necessarily have a library. It's, it's those small things. I mean, if you look at what happened in Limpopo, I mean, active citizenry failed there. I mean, it took a long time. Where were the parents? Why did parents not ask, why, why don't my children have books? Yeah. It only came through through um, politics that we actually discovered that these mm -hmm. children don't have books. And it shouldn't be like that. It should be citizens first That's that, that identify an issue in their community. But you, you know, I think that it's it's uh, it's a common sort of thing that people say we only won and we and we can't do anything. But 
um, as soon as one becomes one plus one and, you know, and becomes, you know, two plus two, you know, goes four and, and eight and 16 and 32 and, and just goes and, and grows. And so even, even if it is just taking part in the conversation, just being part of the discourse, you know, and I look at the things that, that, that I'm kind of done, and I haven't mentioned all of them. I was chairman of governing bodies of schools. I've run sports clubs. I've been involved in, I'm involved in a whole uh, process of trying to get uh, to get the coordinate the action against uh, rhino poaching and all of those things. It all it just takes is a whole lot of one people who can then get to get to be able to coordinate themselves. The big th advantage that we've got now, as opposed to what we had 10, 15 years ago, is we've got the internet. So we can we can f set up ways of coordinating things. We can, you know, because because the internet becomes now no longer. You know, well, the media becomes no longer just a source of information, but it becomes a site of coordination. And it's that coordination of finding these people wherever they are and grouping them together. Then you get critical mass and, and it starts growing and it grows much quicker than it ever, ever used to. This is a massively, it's a real, the golden age of activism. Mm. I think also <clears throat> we, there are existing structures within which people can slot in. Um, the enormous amount of NGOs around doing great so, uh, work in our society. There's the local police, uh, community police forums. There's the uh, ward committees. I, I, there are various uh, groups in the com community who are looking after trying to pro provide uh, uh, housing for homeless people, people who are trying to create uh, recycling projects. All these little things, I think, help uh, enormously in creating the society that we want to see. Walter, I mean, Walter just mentioned, Walter just mentioned how the internet also, you know, helps people coordinate, and also mentioning the these structures, community structures. I just want to go back a step into how the internet coordinates people, because both the Arab Spring and Occupy Wall Street are movements or things that happened which are said to have been encouraged by the internet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay? And it started with citizens. And, it's, and it all started with citizens. But now, one of the things that happens among people is that for some or other reason, which is arguable, we want to be led. Who leads this active citizenship or who leads these initiatives that question how things should or shouldn't be? Mm. Who do you give that leadership to? I think you know, I mean, if I, if I can jump in, I can't hear whether I'm interrupting people, so if I am, I, I apologize for being rude. It's but fine. if you look at what happened with, with Occupy Wall Street, Occupy Wall Street is really, really interesting, how, how it functioned inside Occupy Wall Street, how... Um, who became the powerful people there and actually the powerful people within because I don't know if you know how the people within Occupy Wall Street made decisions they made them very much in the same way even though they were physically there as we do on the, on, on the internet they had thumbs ups and thumbs downs and really what the power was was, was within the facilitators who gave voice to various people, it was how the people facilitated the conversation that 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 allowed these voices to voices to go and to move forward. I think that 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 one of these it's one of these things that we are going to need to get used to the idea is of this democratic process rather than a leader trying to sell his idea to mm -hmm. his followers. What will happen, I think, is a purer form of leadership where leaders are the people who who are most likely to allow their followers to achieve their goals. And that is how Occupy Wall Street worked. That is how the Arab Spring worked and how they were organized and how they were coming together. It's about facilitation, it's about allowing people space, by letting them be able to make decisions, by creating the structures that allowed them to make decisions. Mm -hmm. I know it's, it's just tying in with that. It's a matter of getting people to to identify with an idea rather than a personality, mm. and yeah. that's that's Absolutely. what that's what drives. I mean, the Arab Spring. We don't know who led that. We don't know who led the the, the Occupy Wall Street. I mean, even if we look back seventy six, I don't think we can say who actually led that. It was mm. just more people behind an idea. Mm. Yeah, correct. And, yeah, in in Bulgaria, there's been an interesting development, which is. 
I was I found it quite remarkable that the people they were um, protesting about electricity, uh, uh, cost of electricity going up so high, and they were marching on the government, and they were met by the police, and the police force actually took their helmets off, put their bat down, put their shields down, just stood there. Mm -hmm. And they were making a statement that they were not going to fight the protesters. Then they had a dialogue and they agreed not to fight and they both dispersed. Well, a few days later, the Bulgarian government, well, it's the, they've just resigned. So I, I found that so interesting that you had uh, the military deciding that they, there was not going to be any violence and just standing back and not, not doing anything. And I think it, that, that to me is a remarkable thing that the, these citizen movements can now move forward in a peaceful way and the peak government has to listen to the people which is a big change in in government i think you know re worldwide and i mm -hmm. hope it's going to carry on because we need the governments to serve the people and not the other way around now according you are you are very much involved with communities on the ground what are you finding are some of the challenges that causes people cause people to sort of lag behind on issues of moving on an issue or topics around make taking things forward because some of the things that are said by people who go to community meetings is that everybody wants to have an opinion and you walk out of that out of that meeting without any policies or ac action items yeah you know, the key kind of things are very much grassroots level things. Uh, uh, poverty, for instance, is, is a big one. Uh, lack of jobs, uh, lack of service delivery, lack of facilities. Uh, and, and people just generally don't feel that they, they're getting a good deal from government and, and from the government that they voted for. Um, but it's not, that's in the, perhaps in the poorer communities, but in the the, the the more middle class community that I live in, people are getting upset about lack of service delivery, and uh, the perception is that 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 the government is misspending money. They don't have enough money to actually do their jobs. They employ too many people in government, and they're not actually servicing people on the ground. You know, um, so those are the kind of issues I'm finding mainly. They they're not really political issues. They're more. Um, grassroots, you know, societal issues rather than political. Mm, mm. So, Mabine, you're quite, you're quite young. Um, you contribute to, um, well, actually that's a compliment. <laughs> um, <laughs> you, you. I mean, you contribute on the Daily Maverick, um, Eyewitness News, which is one of the larger news sites in South Africa. Certainly one of the largest radio stations in South Africa. What are you? What do you find are some of the issues that you know that cause people to not listen to you as opposed to someone who's twenty, forty years young, older than you, rather? I, I don't think people actually know how young I actually am. Yeah. When they read my work, I mean, I've uh -huh. often a lot of people say, "I thought you were about in your thirties or, or mid forties." Yes. The way you write, so I, that's why I think. In term, uh, that's why I think it's important young people get involved. There's this whole mentality that because you're young, you can't get involved, you must wait your turn. Yes. And you look at the demographics in South Africa where the majority of unemployed people are young people. The issues that affect young people are there. It's education, it's health. Mm -hmm. So I think young people actually need to step up, step up and be those active citizens yes. and start working towards a society that they want. Yes. Because, I mean, if they don't work towards them now, we're going to have to deal with them later, and it's probably going to be too late to fix them now. Mm. Then, sorry. Mm. One of the things, I think one of the things we've mentioned, um, we've, I mean, we've mentioned the internet and we've mentioned doing things on the ground. Mm -hmm. One of the things that this era is sort of, on the one hand, on the one hand, recommended for, and on the other hand, criticized for, is the fact that most people are sort of becoming desktop activists who sit behind a computer and complain on Twitter and, face and Facebook. How can people on those platforms coordinate themselves and coordinate action rather than be seen as these, you know, people who sit behind computers, computer screens and say things? Mm -hmm. 
You know, I think that it's, I, I, I don't think we should minimize the role of the people that sit around computer screens and say things, because it's all part of changing the consciousness, changing the debate, and taking and taking it forward. There's, there's just a whole lot of roles that a whole lot of different people have. Some people will take it out there, some people won't, some people do want to talk, some people want to talk to their neighbours. Each one of those is a step towards changing society in some way. So I in no way minimise it. But what but what organisations can do, people that want to try and get change to you know to facilitate change can do is empower those people by introducing them to each other, by by providing them with the knowledge or the tools that they need to be able to be activists. And I and I I take that in a in a broad context. I mean, just giving them um, tools that that you can that, that allows you to sign petitions or, or or find ways of giving them posters that they can print out and take, giving them pamphlets, giving them video. Uh, uh, YouTube videos that they can share, getting those places to the next step because because as this movement grows and as more and more people get involved um, and as it takes the imagination of the people and if it doesn't then it probably has isn't its time mm. that then translates into into onto onto the feet on the feet activism on the ground things. Yes. One of the telling things I think that came out of out of the Arab Spring was a a, a, a TED talk that I that I watched where the guy said that that what the internet did was removed the fear and the isolation that each of the people felt mm -hmm. that each of these millions of Egyptians felt. As everybody felt it was wrong, but they felt isolated and they felt scared about taking action. What this did was allow them to feel, remove that fear, and then when they said, okay, let's go and do something about it, and they said, well, let's go and stand around the square with our backs onto the square in a silent protest, that suddenly became powerful, and that went on an online to an offline, back onto an online space, back into an offline space, and it just grew and grew and grew. And I think that's how the anatomy of these kinds of movements is going to happen in the future. Mm. It's interesting that a lot of the uh, people who revolt around the world don't hit mainstream media yes. until it circulates around the social media. Mm -hmm. And then they're forced to, to, show it, to put it in mainstream media. Yes. And I find that quite remarkable with with the Egyptian. I, I knew about it long before the newspapers were actually printing about it and then it suddenly hit the stores and so I, I think the people on, in, on the internet are beginning to realize the power of social media whereas before it was just a means of communicating with each other yes. but I think it also now it is becoming a power for social change and people are beginning to realize this and I think you know, society has to take notice of that and how one moves from the internet into into society directly i think it's just uh when you have an issue people will move you know activism doesn't have to be political activism it can be social activism medical activism um so there are many ways one can be become active and become an educational activist you know? mm -hmm. and social media is it's a 21st century soapbox i mean anyone who has an idea or an opinion can get up there and and say it sometimes doesn't lead to anything, sometimes it does. I mean, like like uh, Walter said, it, it's a certain change, can change consciousness. Because mm. I mean, often, I mean, Youth Lab was started on, on, on Twitter. I mean, the idea came out and I ended up speaking to two other people who had the same kind of idea and said, let's meet up. And I mean, we're a couple of years down the line and we're going well. And when we have our events, we actually use a hashtag and we tweet basically what's going on and therefore you interact with people who are outside the room so a thousand more people mm. who actually aren't in the room and that's that's importance of social media it, mm. it's a tool for so for for so for activism yes. yeah what i mean i think what i'm hearing <coughs> what i'm hearing more and more of is that is that when an idea or when if it's the time for a particular idea to arise it will arise mm -hmm. in 1976 when the you know during the riots and that social activism there wasn't um social media newspapers weren't featuring certain types of news mm -hmm. but because people around the country wanted an action to take place to occur it did mm -hmm. so what is it so what is it about 
say this time and that time that sort of makes ideas whose whose time is relevant for them mm. to survive or rather what what you know what's what environment should be created for ideas of social change to thrive or to be acted upon by people and i think we've lost walter Mr. Lee. Uh -huh. It's well, just you're still there, Walter. Yeah, I am, but okay. I, I hear it's going a little bit burbly. Okay. okay. Yeah, I, I um, I'm not really sure that um, in Soweto in '76, because I was active in Soweto in 1976. I was yes. involved with uh, several youth groups at the time, and there was a social media. Yes. But it wasn't internet based. Uh -huh. The people were talking amongst each other and it was more a community kind of internet rather than a, a internet as we have it now. And uh, as a white person being in Suet at the time, I could feel the stirring, I could feel, could feel the anger developing. And th there came a time, one or two weeks before it actually happened, I knew I should stay away from Soweto because something was going to happen. Mm -hmm. And uh, people were talking openly. Now, I think the big thing is, is it's the will of the people. When the people decided they'd had enough, they decided they were going to do something about it. And I think that's going to happen in any issue. It's, it's when people get ready, as old saying goes, cut for, mm -hmm. then they will do something about it. And that certainly was what happened in 76. And I think we're going to see social change because now people have this thing called the internet and instead of sitting at home being isolated, they can now go into the internet and hear about and talk about issues that are affecting them. And it's, it's going to be very powerful. And it's when the will of the people say, this is what we want, and then we'll see social change happening. I mean, if we look no, no, at... I mean, what, what it does, in a way, is that they're not isolated, even though the people that they... You know, the people around them might not have the same view as them. They can connect to people in other towns because the internet removes this concept of, of space and geography. Yeah. You know, you 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 can group around ideas, which is what uh, we what I call social objects that are, are just ideas. And people group around ideas. And so, so what the internet has done, it hasn't changed the fundamental human behavior stuff. It's just amplified it and made it go much much quicker and. And and things that used to that could take years to take place can now take place in days mm. and weeks and things like that. And literally, they can. If you look at the the rape of Anine Boyce and and, and her murder, yeah. subsequently um, on Twitter, it became a huge thing. And I think a lot of people ended up discounting the fact that what people are talking about on Twitter. But I think at some point, I mean, it may not have been the majority of South Africans, but a lot of South Africans started talking about about rape in South Africa and what it means and the hashtag stop rape started trending across across the country and I don't think we've had that conversation about rape in South Africa and what it means uh, the, the societal um, contributors to, to what produces a rapist we haven't had those conversations yet whether it was for just for 15 minutes that conversation happened in South Africa mm. Mm. So as we, we start to wrap up maybe um, I'm going to ask you all just how we can contact you, but a question just to that you can start thinking about is, I mean, you're all passionate in, in your own different areas about what you are, you know, active in, in driving and, and contributing to. If there was a message you would want to give to someone listening to us tonight about who's, who's not sure how to get involved or, you know, we spoke about the, you know, the power of one. If one and one get together, it becomes two, and then two and two become four. So, so for me, the message would be to just take some kind of action. Just start talking, and you'll be amazed to see who else is feeling the same, and then you can, you know, get something going. But I don't know if you have any anything you want to share. Just each of you, a message you'd want to give to someone. Well, it's you know, it, <laughs> go, go ahead. Go, well, go ahead. <laughs> okay. Um, you know, I mean, I remember. That, I mean, those of you, us of a certain age could probably remember a guy could, called uh, Woody Guthrie who. Who um, and 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 a song actually it wasn't him that did it, but a song called Alice's Restaurant, where they spoke about uh, a sort of protest movements leading through to the Vietnam War of how you know if people got together and how things could 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 move and grow. Alice's Restaurant is a fantastic lesson in in what happens and how you can do it. And I would say if I had to give advice to people is just 
do something, just say something, even if it's just to talk to your neighbor and just start expressing your views because it's that discourse, it's that conversation, it's out of that conversation that comes these these movements where people pick up on it and say, yes, I agree, and it grows and grows and grows. I mean, the slut walk movement, you know, I mean, it, it arose out of somebody just getting totally irritated in Canada about the idea that the victim... Oh, and it looks like we've, we've lost Walter, so... Walter, you might, you probably will come back in a moment, so... Um, so, Colin, do you want to do anything, any yeah. advice you would give? Yeah, it, it sometimes is a cliche, but the truth is be the change you want to see. It's no good expecting someone else to create that change. You have to go and make it happen for yourself. So be, be that change. Anything you would say, Mabini? I mean, often, you know, at the beginning when, when Youth Lab started, you often think that you're alone and, and you don't have the support that you want, but then you realize that Often society is waiting for that person to step up, and reality is that you've got to be that person that's going to step up. And if you're leading legitimately and you've got that that idea, people will follow. Great, so step up, people. And um, if someone would like to get hold of you, my Benny, what's the best way? Um, we're on Twitter at YouthLabZA, and you can email info at YouthLab.org.za. Great, so you can get hold of Walter on Twitter at Walter Pike. Um, so yeah, share your views. Tell us how you are going to become an active citizen. We'd love to hear more about what you are getting active and starting, and maybe we can even help you get it going. Um, so you can tweet us on LT Possibility or share your comments on Facebook. So until next week then, from, from me, Talana Simpson, and all of us here on Let's Talk Possibility, have a great week. And don't just think it, go and do it. Yeah.